Welcome back. It's four o'clock, so now we start. Uh, this talk is about WhatsApp, Web3, and Wordle, an evolving digital society. Please welcome Dylan. Hey, Joe Focus. How you doing? So, uh, we're going to kick off today with a nice, easy question. Tabs or spaces? No, not bad. <laughs> We're going to start off today by asking, is internet access a fundamental human right? Now, just under a year ago, this man sent a letter to this man. The man on the left is Mikhail Fedorov, the deputy prime minister of Ukraine, the Ukrainian minister for digital transformation. And the gentleman on the right here is uh, Yoran Mabi, who is the, uh, the CEO and president of ICANN, the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers. They're the people who are, they're sort of like the internet government. And the internet doesn't have a lot of government, but they are the people who make sure that you get your own IP address blocks and they manage the DNS root server network. And uh, I'm sure you can guess from the timing and the context what this letter was about. It was a letter asking for ICANN's help in the war against Russia, specifically asking ICANN to introduce the following list of sanctions targeting the Russian Federation's access to the internet, to revoke the domains .ru, uh, .fair, and uh, did you know the Soviet Union had a top-level domain? .su is still out there, still resolves. And uh, revoke the SSL certificates for all of those domains and shut down the two DNS root servers situated in the Russian Federation, St. Petersburg and Moscow. Now, I've been to Ukraine many times. I've been to tech conferences there. I've talked to Ukrainian developers, entrepreneurs, startups, and uh, digital transformation in Ukraine, until Russia came along, was doing incredibly well. What was happening in the country there was astonishing. And I'm pretty sure that the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation, based on what I've seen, is a smart guy who knows what he's doing. In the UK, our Minister for Digital Transformation this time last year was a woman called Nadine Dorries, who had a meeting with Microsoft where she asked them when they were going to ban the algorithms. So, yeah. Now, I'm sure that Mr. Fedorov knew the answer would be no. And sure enough, the reply came back very quickly from ICANN saying, we sympathize and we support you and we absolutely are on your side with what is going on, but we are not going to do the things you asked us to do. ICANN has been built to ensure that the internet works, not for its coordination role to be used to stop it from working. Now, the same time, Mikhail Fedorov sent another letter, and this letter went to an organization you have probably never heard of, Ripe NCC. Now, Ripe NCC, do not own any infrastructure. They don't own any cables, they don't own any data centers, they don't provide any cloud services, hosting platforms, anything like that. But if Ripe NCC ceased to exist, the internet would stop working. Not right away. It would be fine for a couple of weeks, maybe a few months. Then uh, one day you'd realize that you tried to send an email to someone in another company or another country and it bounced and it couldn't get through. There were some websites that you couldn't get to anymore. You couldn't WhatsApp certain friends, and eventually you would realize you couldn't reach large parts of the internet. And to understand why, we need to understand what it is that RIPE actually do. Now, when we draw the internet, we draw it like this. The internet is up there, it's the cloud, and uh, we have our little devices, and we connect to it using a line with an arrow at both ends, because this is how technology works. And so all of our devices connect to the internet, because we are little, and the internet is big. But if you are big, if you are Microsoft, if you are Google, if you are Telenor or Telia or any of the big telecoms providers, massive tech companies, if you own cable that crosses entire countries, you don't connect to the internet. You are the internet. And what you do, there are these things called internet exchange points, IXPs. And so Microsoft, go to Telenor Sweden, and they say, hey, we've both got cable running into this building. Uh, how about if we carry your traffic, you'll carry our traffic, because then the internet will work better. And so when I send a message to you, an email, or I send a, a packet to you as part of a Zoom call, or we're playing Far Cry or whatever, we are actually bouncing traffic through this network, which is mostly owned by other companies, other telecoms providers, communications networks. And RIPE NCC, 
is the organization that gets all those people together in a room a couple of times a year and says, come on, everyone, let's sort it out. Who's carrying traffic for who? And it facilitates peering agreements. These are free exchanges of traffic. Ripe NCC covers Europe. There is another one, uh, Arin covers North America. There is LACNIC, which is Latin America, the Caribbean, South America. There is uh, APNIC covers, or AFRINIC covers Africa, and APNIC covers the Asia Pacific region. And between them, they basically make the internet work at a massive global scale. Now, the reply came back from RIPE NCC to Mikhailo Fedorov pretty quickly saying, we sympathize, what's happening is dreadful, we are on your side, but we are not gonna shut Russia out of the internet. Uh, we believe that internet number resource registrations should not be used as a means to enforce political outcomes. That doing so would have serious implications for the internet, not just for the Russian Federation, but also for the rest of the world. Like if you wanna send an email from Stockholm to Shanghai, it's probably gonna go through Russia. You cut Russia off, suddenly Europe can't see Asia anymore. You know, there are much bigger things at stake here for the functioning of the internet as a system, as a piece of technology. So, this question, you know, is internet access a fundamental human right? Well, the two organizations who might be in a position to enforce it have both said no. We are not prepared to shut things down. We are not prepared to disconnect people from it. Tim Berners-Lee, the uh, creator of the World Wide Web, he believes internet access should be a human right. In October 2020, he addressed the European Parliament um, as part of an event that was called Ideas for a New World, and uh, he is calling for a, a future where internet access is understood and realized as a basic human right. And if that's not enough, Let's go right to the source, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights ratified by the United Nations in the, the aftermath of World War II. Now, for some reason in 1948, they didn't think to put Wi-Fi in the things we all have fundamental access to, but they did use some fairly inclusive and expansive language. Uh, Article 19, everyone has the right to a freedom of opinion and expression, includes the freedom to hold opinions, receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Sounds to me like that means we should all be allowed internet access. And then Article 27.1, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancements and its benefits, including Netflix and Disney Plus and TikTok and all the other benefits that we get from scientific advancement. <laughs> so, okay, let's say yes, we have the right to internet access. It is a fundamental right. What does it look like? What would it look like? Now, I think, this is kind of my proposal at what I think our fundamental right should be enshrined as, is that you have the right to connect to the network and to get an internet address, an IP address for as long as you need it. If you transmit a properly formed and correctly addressed packet across the internet, if your destination address exists, that packet will reach its destination. And if anybody else anywhere on the internet transmits a properly formed packet that's addressed to you, that packet will be delivered to you. Now that doesn't sound like much, but uh, let's do a little thought experiment here. Let's say that we work for the, the Ministry of Transportation with a government office that controls the freeways, and uh, we wanna buy a yacht, because we're bored, we want money, we wanna get disgustingly rich. And so we go, right, we control the freeways, let's do some deals. So we wipe the speed limits. And then we, uh, we put word around saying, hey, uh, speed limits are available for sale. And BMW pop up straight away and go, hey, we'll give you two billion Swedish kroner if you make the speed limit for BMWs 170 kilometers per hour. And then Audi go, oh yeah, we'll have some of that. Two billion, we'll give you three billion to do that as well. And Ford come along and they're like, well, our cars don't go that fast, but uh, we'll give you one billion if, you, if you, Ford's 150. And uh, then Toyota say, well, uh, 90, that seems reasonable for us. And then they say, right, well, that's it. That's it, the deals are over. We've got enough money for our yacht. All other cars are limited to 50 kilometers per hour. That's the law. And then big oil gets wind of this, and they're like, oh, hang on. Uh, we'll give you 10 billion kroner if you ban electric cars, because they are really harshing our buzz right now. And this becomes the freeway system. If you want to go fast, you have to drive a BMW. If you buy an electric car, you're not allowed to use it on the road because the people who control the roads have been paid to not let you do that. And everyone else, you know, the uh, Saabs and Volvos and everything are pootling along at 50 kilometers an hour going, how the hell did this happen? You know, what went wrong? Now, 
There are companies out there who want to do this to the internet and have been trying to do this to the internet for as long as the internet has existed. In the United States of America, domestic broadband, folks at home browsing, working remote, Zoom, Netflix, all that kind of stuff, almost all of them get their internet from one of four providers, the big four. And in most places in the US, you don't have a choice. You get your internet from whichever one of these works in your neighborhood, or you have dial-up. Now, a few years ago, uh, 2007, that is more than a few years ago, 15 years ago, um, wow, I'm old, Comcast, a bunch of folks using Comcast were uh, downloading files from a pirate website that they found, and they noticed that their download speeds were getting throttled. Like they had, you know, healthy six, eight megabit broadband, but when they went to download torrents from the pirate bay, they were only getting uh, like 100 kilobits a second. And they took Comcast to court and they filed complaints with the Federal Communications Commission, which is the government body in the US that basically runs communications, internet media, and they sued them. And they said, Comcast is uh, suing our traffic, is uh, throttling our traffic, we want to file a complaint, we're paying them for 10 megabit, we want 10 megabit. And uh, that went to court, and they won. The FCC ruled that yes, this was illegal, Comcast had sold them 10 megabits, they were not allowed to throttle traffic. If you're paying for 10 megs, you get 10 megs, whatever you're using it for. If you're using it for something illegal, that is not your internet provider's responsibility. That is for the police and the FBI to deal with. Now, <coughs> this went to the um, Court of Appeal and then to the Supreme Court. And interestingly, the, the, the Supreme Court specifically said that the FCC did, a, there was a, a countersuit against this. And they said that the FCC did not actually have jurisdiction. They didn't say anything about net neutrality, but on appeal, this got overturned. They said the FCC, in this exact instance, did not exactly have the exact authority to do the exact... Now, when courts do this, it's sending a big warning going, you need to get your shit together and phrase this differently and sort it out. We've let you through on a loophole this once, and on the back of this, something called the US Open Internet Order was drafted, which guaranteed transparency. Internet providers have to be completely transparent with their users about how traffic is getting shaped, throttled, managed. You're not allowed to block anything, and there was no unreasonable discrimination. You are not allowed to say, well, uh, the Disney Plus packets are more important than the Netflix packets, because Disney Plus gave us more money than Netflix. And uh, this was uh, pushed through the US courts. It got up to, uh, I believe, Congress, and they turned it down. And they went, this is going to interfere with capitalism, and this is America, and we love capitalism. There will be no US open internet order. This was 2010. I don't know if any of you remember the day that Reddit went black and all these different websites blacked out. That was the day that transparent internet died in the United States. 2014, sorry. And a massive blow to network neutrality in the US. But the rest of the world looked at it and went, what the hell just happened? Like, did the, how, how did they do that? Can, could that happen here? And jumped on it. And so the, uh, here in Europe, the EU Open Internet Regulation 2015 was drafted and ratified, which guaranteed transparency, your ISP has to tell you exactly what they will and will not do with your traffic. They are not allowed to block it, and they are not allowed to discriminate traffic based on sources or destinations or providers. And this became law. In, uh, throughout the European Union, this was an act of EU Parliament 2015. And so everyone in the European Union has this legally enshrined right to unregulated, transparent, unblocked internet traffic, which I think is pretty cool. Because, you know, I think network neutrality is awesome. But it turns out uh, that normal people... Now, I'm actually going to flip Dina. There's a, there's a gender-flipped version of this meme. We're going to use this one. And uh, it turns out that uh, normal humans do not care about network neutrality. They don't really know what it is. And if they did, they're like, boring. Normal humans care about music and photos and shopping and holidays and movies and talking to their friends and seeing silly cat pictures. And the reason why all of these things are suddenly, like within the last 20 years, have suddenly become network neutrality issues is because we invented the World Wide Web, which I have been using for so long that this was the logo of the World Wide Web when I first started building websites way back in 1992. Now, one of the things about the web, I loved making websites back in the 90s. I love making websites today. And one of the things that makes web development so uh, 
fun, you know, such an enjoyable thing to do, is that browsers were and are an incredibly tolerant and forgiving development platform. If you, uh, anyone here, work with C, like GCC, and C, C-type languages, and uh, we got a little program here, we got hello.c, and yeah, that looks pretty good, let's run it. And the compiler says, human being, you are stupid. You have missed a semicolon, and therefore your program is nonsense, and I will not even deign to attempt to run it, because you are inferior and kneel before your new GCC compiler overlords. But web browsers, so imagine we want to write a web page. Now, we don't know very much. And this is early. This is the 90s. Like, you know, we, we haven't got Stack Overflow and stuff. Uh, we maybe don't even have an internet connection. Maybe we're doing this on our C drive in Notepad and then going and opening it in Internet Explorer 2 to see what it looks like. But uh, we're pretty sure that web pages have a head, right? And uh, if something's got a head, maybe it can have a face. And then it's got a body, and we know that H1's a heading, because we've seen that by doing right-click view source on something. And uh, then we want some text to be read, so we're going to say font color equals red. Look, I made a web page. We're going to put in a line break. And uh, then we're going to have font color equals blue, because we've got different colors in here. And uh, then let's put in a picture of Mac, who's, who's my cat. Um, so image source equals cat, name equals Mac, likes equals snack. Um, slash body, yeah, that's important. And we've got a head, we've got a body, we probably need feet, right? So uh, also my web page has got feet. And then we're really excited, so we don't notice that we typed HTLM instead of HTML to close it out. And so there it is. Now get your phones out and scan that QR code. It's all right, you can trust me, I'm a professional. Nope. It is, literally, it's that. That HTML renders that web page. And it works. And it works because browsers are not GCC. Browsers are like, this is clearly nonsense. But I think I know what you mean. <laughs> like, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this my best shot at figuring it out. And this is a wonderful example of something called Postel's Law. Uh, this is John Postel. He wrote the specification for TCP IP way back in 1980, and he included some advice in that spec. This is the time when, like, you know, to get the internet to work, I had to implement TCP IP on my PDP-10, and you had to implement it on your VAX, and somebody else had to implement it on their DEC Alpha or whatever. And uh, his advice was be conservative in what you send and be liberal in what you accept. When you send data to the network, don't be a dick. Send something that kind of makes sense and conforms to the spec. But if you receive something from the network that maybe isn't 100% compliant, if you can figure out what it means, then do that. You know, be tolerant, be liberal in what you accept. Now, there's a wonderful example of this, which has nothing to do with software and the internet. 1975, at the height of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union had a joint mission, the Apollo-Soyuz missions. They were going to launch a uh, Apollo capsule from the US and a uh, um, uh, Soyuz capsule from uh, the Soviet Union. They were going to rendezvous in orbit, and there's this great photograph of uh, Tom Stafford and Alexei Leonov shaking hands through the airlock. Now, uh, one, this kind of gives me hope. Like, things were bad back then, and they still did this, and things are kind of bad now, but let's still be optimistic about people using tech to, to do cool things and shake hands in space. But they had to solve a whole load of technical challenges to make that mission work. They had incompatible hardware, incompatible orbital maneuvering restrictions, incompatible everything, incompatible languages. The American astronauts did not speak Russian, and the Russian cosmonauts did not speak English. And so they all went to an intensive language school, and the rule, the mission protocol, was the Americans spoke Russian and the Russians replied in English. You had to speak the language that you had just done a three-month intensive course, but then you would hear the reply in the language you had been speaking since you were born. And this was a wonderful way, NASA and the, the Soviet space program, they kind of worked out, this is going to eliminate misunderstandings because it means that the person who is speaking is always restricted because they've only got a three-month crash course. They don't know that many words. And the person who is listening is going to be trying to make sense of it. And so this is early HTML and browsers. This is, is me, Tom Stafford, in Russian, going, hey. Blah, 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 blah. And this is the browser going, that's nonsense, but I think I understand what you mean. Beautiful demonstration of, of, of Postel's law. Now, 
One of the uh, interpretations of this, in the, the sort of the history of the web, there have been all kinds of phases where everyone went, oh, there's this uh, amazing thing. We want this feature on our website. We want a, a photograph of our restaurant menu. And when you click on it, all the spaghetti gets up and does a little dance. And of course, browsers can't do that. So you had to install a plugin to get your browser to do it. And most of those plugins were a good idea for about a week. And then they were a pain in the ass for about a year. And then they were like, you can't install this anymore. It violates security. So all of those websites that used Shockwave and Flash and Java applets, getting those websites to work now is difficult because those components just got abandoned, discarded by the wayside. But get your phones out again. I'll show you one more, one more little interactive uh, website. Scan that QR code or just punch in that web address there. Because this, this is a relic. This is a museum piece. This is a website that I built in 1997, and I maintained it for about 18 months, and then I got bored, and I stopped. But it stayed online. Static HTML, it just sat there. And uh, eventually, I migrated my old university website to my own server, and then I migrated my server to another one, and then I put it in the cloud. And then a couple of years ago, I rebuilt DylanBT.net using Jekyll Pages, and three weeks later, I got an email from someone going, what happened to the Star Wars webpage? I'm like, are you joking? They're like, no, 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 it's really cool. This is that site. And literally, when I say that that is a relic, I have not touched the code since before Jar Jar Binks existed. <laughs> like, you know, if you've always thought Star Wars was Jar Jar, no, no, this website is older than you. And this is what the code looks like. This is some good quality, late 90s vintage, handwritten HTML. It's all in block capitals because it was serious computer language and CSS didn't really exist. But it works. And if I'd built it in Flash or Shockwave or any of these proprietary extensions, it wouldn't work. It would just be a gray screen. But because I was being liberal or conservative in what I sent, I was working to a sort of lowest common denominator, this has stood the test of time and it still works today on a mobile device that you know, no one even imagined Android and iPhones in the days when I built this. But now it just works. And that, that was what I loved about building websites in the 90s. And, uh, Web development in 2023, it's awesome. We have so much amazing stuff. We have APIs for doing video and audio and streaming and playing MIDI files. And uh, there's an accelerometer API. You can build a web page that changes color if you drop it. <laughs> How cool is that? And as a developer, I love the web as a platform. But as a consumer, you know, as somebody who uses the web to do shopping and read the news and all that kind of stuff, the modern web kind of sucks. And uh, I think a lot of that boils down to two things that the original creators of the web, I don't think they overlooked it. I think they just kind of, the genie got out of the bottle before they had time to properly figure it out. And those are money and identity. Now, uh, the HTML or the HTTP specification from uh, 20 odd years ago does actually say, um, we've got a, an HTTP 403 payment required. This code is reserved for future use. In 1999, 2000, they said, oh, we'll sort this out later. 23 years, they still haven't sorted it out. The code is there. And, you know, HTTP included authentication and headers, and there was some sort of awareness with the, the people who developed the protocol that identity and money were probably going to be important at some point. But they never really came up with a workable solution for it. Now, there are three kind of models of doing commerce over the web. And one of them took off almost right away, and that's mail order. You put your credit card in a web page, you click submit, and in the morning, Amazon turns up with packages from Cardboard Santa Claus, and you're like, woo, I got new stuff. And we had mail order before. We'd ordered by fax, we'd ordered by phone, we'd ordered by sending forms in the mail. So this one, everyone was fine. It's just a different way of doing the same thing. And then there's the download model, which is where you pay money and you get data, and the data is a song, or the data is a movie, or the data is a, an ebook or something. And you know, for a while, this was, is this ever gonna catch on? Are people actually comfortable spending real money on bits? But it turned out, yeah, we are, because we don't care about the bits, we want the song, we want the game, we want the movie or the app or whatever. So this really, really took off in a big way. But then the third model is the one where the content of the web page is actually the product. News, media, magazines, publishing. And this is where the web has really, really sort of struggled to make sense of anything. Now. Uh, the days of print publishing, let's make a newspaper. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to hire you to write stuff. You know, some of you I'll pay you by the word. Some of you I'll give you a salary. You're going to come on staff. We're going to write stories, go around, see what's happening in the neighborhood or in the world. Write it all down. Make something people want to read. They'll pay us money. And it's, a, it's an easy transaction. It's, you know, a couple of euros or what, a few tens of crowns to get a newspaper. And it's paper. It's cheap paper. You read it and then you, you recycle it. Everyone's comfortable with that. And then we got to advertise this. We're like, hey, we got uh, 5,000 people in this neighborhood reading our paper. Do you want to run adverts? And they give us some money. And this becomes a sustainable business model. Problem is, we never worked out how to do that with the web. Now, a couple of years ago, this started appearing on people's Twitter feeds and Facebook pages and WhatsApp groups. And uh, every morning, you'd wake up and a bunch of your friends would have posted their daily Wordle updates. And you're like, oh, you got it in five. Well done. Anyone here still playing Wordle? I still play occasionally, yeah. Now, Wordle is fantastic. Wordle is absolutely wonderful. And Wordle was not created as a product. It wasn't a startup. It didn't take any investment. It wasn't like an IPO get rich quick. Wordle was a gift, literally. Josh Wardle, who created it, made it as a present for his partner because she liked word games. He, she, I don't actually know the gender of Josh Wardle's partner. Um, his partner liked word games. And so he created this and said, here, have this. It's fun. And then uh, people started sending it to their friends. There was no big launch, no marketing, no publicity. Somebody on Twitter came up with this way of sharing the game status using the little colored emoji. And Josh liked this, and he put a share button in the game. And boom, suddenly it went viral. And uh, by January last year, there were 2 million people every day playing Wordle. 2 million people is a lot of people. If 2 million people buy your record, you get two platinum discs. If 2 million people go and see your movie, you break every box office record in the history of Hollywood by a factor of 10. 2 million is an amazing number of people when you think about it. Now, let's see how much did it cost to host Wordle for 2 million people. Now, this is Wordle, all of it. The entire game is less than 200 kilobytes. It's a progressive web app, so it's implemented as a web component. The whole thing downloads into local storage. It doesn't use any cookies. There's no backend server. There's no database. That 188 kilobits there, that includes seven years' worth of Wordle. All there. So you only need to download it once. 200 kilobyte, one-time download, and that's it. You're playing Wordle until the year 2031 or something. Now, let's figure out how much that costs. So we got 200 kilobytes. We got 2 million people. Uh, we're going to go on to S3. Pricing on there was uh, this, you know, 9 cents a gigabyte. So uh, let's get Bart to help us with the maths here. 9 cents a gig is that much per megabyte, that much per kilobyte, 200 kilobytes, that much per player, times 2 million players is, oh, no, $36. We don't have that kind of money. <laughs> now, let's imagine that instead of selling Wordle to the New York Times so they could put registration and cookies and sign-ups and marketing on it, let's imagine that Josh gave it to us. And he said, I want you to take Wordle, and I want you to look after it and run it as a non-profit. It just needs to break even. You can charge a little bit of money, just enough to cover the running costs. So we go and, and we put Wordle in the Xbox Game Store, and uh, it costs that. <coughs> and the credit card people are like, what are you doing? And we're like, well, that, that's hard. And they're like, you can't charge someone that little. Um, this actually, by a weird coincidence, uh, the, uh, the lowest valued currency in the world at the moment is the Iranian real. And this is almost exactly one Iranian real. That's how much. So if we could like, do it on the, the Iranian currency market, we'd charge one real to play Wordle for the rest of your life. But uh, there's all kinds of problems with setting up payment providers in Iran and then selling it around the world. So let's say, no, you know what? Um, listen, let, let's say it's a dollar. Let's say you want to play Wordle. It's a dollar a year. That, that, you know, most people would be comfortable with that. But then we're like, oh, well, it's a dollar a year. So now, well, first of all, we need to start keeping track of our users because we need to know, well, who's, uh, who's paid for it? So we need to create a user database because we don't want to give it away for people who haven't given us the dollar. That would be, you know, that's bad capitalism. Uh, so then uh, we need to hire a database developer. And then we're going to need to hire a security expert because we've got personally identifiable information. So we need to do GDPR audits and all that kind of stuff. And we've got to register a company for the revenue, which means we need an accountant. And uh, we've got to send emails to people when they sign up and play, which means we've got to find a relay provider and oh, we've got to get a UX designer. And suddenly we're like, $2 million a year probably isn't actually enough to run this for free. you know? Because we've gone from 36 
to, well, we can't charge that little, to let's make it a dollar, to now we have all these other things we need to do, to this is going to add up. Like, two million is probably not enough to do that. And this is uh, the tragedy of the open web, is if you are prepared to spend a little bit of your own money, you can create wonderful things, and you can put them out there, and the entire planet can come along and play with them for free. And if you have a product that people will pay 10, 20, 50 dollars for, it's worth doing all of the infrastructure, the taxes and the accounting and the security. But then there's this gap in the middle. This is the gap where printed magazines and newspapers and those kinds of things sit, where it just, there's no economic model on the web that makes sense, not on the open web. And so what happens is people go to walled gardens and people jump over to things like the Apple App Store and they put their apps in there and Apple says, well, yeah, that's fine. You want to put your app in here, you can sell it in here. That, that works absolutely fine. And they take 30%. And you're like, well, it's better than nothing. And they handle all the taxes and everything. And then if they decide they don't like you, that's it. Your revenue stream is gone. You're cut off. No right of appeal. They don't have to tell you why they did it. You could put your heart and soul into building your games platform. And then if Apple and the Google Play Store decide they don't like you, then that's it. And you have no alternative. There's no other way of, of selling this stuff. And so. Uh, a lot of folks turn to sites like this, Medium, Patreon, Bandcamp, YouTube, all of these are ways that you, somebody else makes money from your content and they give you a little bit of it. Or in some cases, they give you a fairly large bit of it. But you still have no control of the relationship between your content and your end user. And so the only way we found to generate revenue out of a website that you control is to run adverts on it. Now, I've been building websites since before they had adverts on them. I remember when this was invented, and somebody would be like, hey, you got that website that all the people are looking at? And you'd be like, yeah. And they're like, well, what do you want to sell them? And they'd be like, well, I, I make cheese. Can I put cheese on your website for, I don't know, 100 euros a month? And I'd be like, yeah. And we didn't know if that was a good amount of money, and they had no idea if that was a good amount. We just kind of made it up as we went along. And there it was. We put the banner advert on the website. And then we invented click tracking, so they could see how many times a month somebody bought cheese from that advert. And then we invented analytics. And then we got to the point where it's like, well, the people building the websites, we don't want to be in the advertising business. So we partnered with brokers. And we're like, look, here's the top of our website. You, you sell adverts, you just put them in here and send us the money at the end of the month. And then the brokers got smart. And the brokers automated the entire process. And today, when, you open a, when I open a page on a website, what happens in that first 100 milliseconds is a bunch of code running up there in the cloud. It's like, roll up, roll up, roll up. We got a you know, white British male, 44 years old. He likes cats. He likes guitars. We know he's going to Stockholm. We know he's going to Copenhagen. Who wants to show him an advertisement for 50 cents? 40 cents, 30 cents, 20, 10, 5, 2. And when it gets to 1 cent, there's a company out there who are like, we'll advertise sports bras to anybody for 1 cent. And so I get an advert for a sports bra. And I'm like, I don't understand capitalism. How is this making anything better for anybody? And if you want to see what's actually going on behind the scenes, go on to a, go on to a bad website, like a terrible website, like, a, like this one, the Metro website. And uh, instead of just clicking got it, go into cookie settings. Ooh, let's see if we can get video playing. Uh, oh, Oh, I think we're having fun and games here. Da, 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 da. I think we are having what is known as the M1 Mac doesn't work experience. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so capitalism has created the 2,500 euro laptop that can't play videos over HDMI. <laughs> uh, oh, there we go. Look, that's sort of vaguely working now. Now, if you go in and uh, you take a look and you say, all right, please show me all of the companies that are participating in this auction. This is the list. This is all of the companies who I, as a consumer, are expected to go, do I consent to cookies from this company, yes or no? Do I consent to cookies from this company, yes or no, yes or no, yes or no? Um, you know, the whole system has just gone completely haywire. And the number of companies I see out there to run their website would take one person with a copy of Vim and Apache. To run their advertising network takes a team of 25 full stack developers, which means they need to pay 25 full stack developer salaries and have 25 web servers and host the whole thing. Now, this, uh, you know, advertising as a way of bringing in website revenue has got to the point where it actively detracts from uh, websites. If anyone was in Sophia's session a moment ago about the environmental impact, 
you know, the size of a website has gone from like 600K to two megabytes, and that's all advertising and tracking. It's not that the website's actually got any better. Now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, actually a couple of months ago now, um, I was in Oslo in Norway, and uh, I was using Google search for a thing. Well, we'll get back to this in a second, but uh, that whole advertising model, how does it know that white, male, British, 44, I'm in Stockholm, I'm in Copenhagen, I like cats, I like guitars. It knows that because I search for things. I use Google, I use Amazon, I use WhatsApp, I use TikTok, I, I use all the things because I like gadgets and I'm a nerd. And every time I do, I create this trail of footprints and things come along, they hoover up the footprints and they create a profile that they can then go out and say, hey, we now have this, uh, this business relationship that we can go and sell people. And this is not how it's supposed to work. The web is built on protocols. It's built on agreements between peers. The idea when Tim Berners-Lee first created the web, he thought that the, the consumer and the publisher were equal participants in this relationship. It's why HTTP has put and delete, because we were gonna write pages and we were gonna remove pages, and then browsers came along and went, no, 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 get and post, that's all anyone's ever gonna need. Now, a couple of weeks back, um, I sent someone some directions to come and meet me at a, an event we were doing together, and uh, it didn't get through. It went to junk mail, and they were using Gmail. And uh, I was like, well, this is weird. Now, I send email from dylanbt.net, which is my own domain. I've owned it for 25 years. I've never spammed. I don't have a marketing list. I don't have a mailing list. I don't do anything with that domain except send email I wrote myself by hand. But this happened. This is Gmail. Now, Gmail has two billion active accounts. Doesn't mean a quarter of the planet uses Gmail, but that's the order of magnitude we're talking about. It used to be, if you sent someone an email and it went to junk, then, you know, they had a problem, because they're like, oh no, your email went to junk. If Gmail decides you're sending junk, you have a problem. And you have a problem you can't solve. Because you can't phone Gmail and go, stop sending my email to spam. It's legitimate email, you know, honestly. And this is a problem because we've taken what was the open protocol of email and it's converging on these massive monolithic providers. Now, uh, how many of you uh, use Slack? Yeah, we all do. We got the thing. Uh, how many of you in here are using click, 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 click? Come on, come on, come on. You can do it. Teams. Discord. Signal. Telegram. Raise both hands if you use all of these every day. Now, you know, when I get a thing like JFocus is like we got a Slack, I'm like, ah, oh, it would be nice if I could join the Slack from my Discord, because I like Discord. After all, if I send you an email to Gmail, I don't have to use Gmail to send it, I can send it from Outlook, or I can send it from iPhone mail, I can use these interoperable things. But there is this convergence. We are abandoning open protocols in favor of closed platforms. Um, Reddit, the front page of the internet, which is a website that exists because the web is full of cool stuff that people want to talk about. And if you go to the Reddit website on your phone, you get this pop-up that says, hey, do you want to see it in the app? Open, big, blue, bold, continue in Chrome, little and gray and muted. And you're like, no, this is fine. And the next one comes up and it's like, yeah, it's better in the app. And you're like, no, go away, I'm fine. It's like, Haha, the app has unlimited cats. And you're like, no. Oh no, the app has unlimited dogs. And then uh, if you, I had this a couple of weeks ago, someone sent a, or posted a link to a blue screen of death on a cash machine, and Reddit went, oh no, that's not safe for work. You can't view that on the website. Reddit want you on their app. Reddit want you on their app because you can't install an ad blocker on Reddit's app, and you can't block user tracking on Reddit's app, and once you are in their app, they can control and watch every single thing that you do. This is not how the web was supposed to work. And uh, a couple of months back, this guy, Felix Krause, he published a website called In-App Browser, and the idea is you put a link on like Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, any page the way that you have an app where you can click on links, go to this website from it, and it will show you what is getting injected. Because when you click a link on Facebook on your phone, you're not opening a browser, you're opening Facebook's built-in browser, and it injects JavaScript to track what you do. They want to control the entire experience. Now, the open web still exists. All these protocols still work, because protocols never die. It's just they become obsolete and they stop getting supported. But I'm increasingly seeing companies. When I was in uh, Oslo uh, late last year for NDC, I went on the webinar, I was like, hey, let's find a good bar to go and watch some music after we're done with parties and stuff, and so I, I punched in this search. Now, I did this today in Stockholm, but it turns out all the rock bars in Stockholm are awesome, and they actually have their own websites, which is cool, but in Norway, they're like, no, 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 we don't need a website, we'll just have a Facebook page, which is fine if you're on Facebook, but Facebook is not the web. 
My relationship with a bar where I want to go and have a drink and watch some music should not be mediated by a trillion dollar corporation based out of San Francisco. And this is getting worse. There are companies out there now that run on WhatsApp. The Radisson Hotel here, I checked in yesterday, I got a, this is a WhatsApp business message. Hey, Mr. Beatty, if there's any, I'm like, why are you using WhatsApp for this? Like, how is that company involved in me staying in your hotel? And this convergence, there are companies in India now, WhatsApp, you can uh, book hotels, you can uh, book cinema tickets, you can order food, you can order taxis, all of it mediated through WhatsApp's business platform, which means companies are entirely dependent on WhatsApp because they have no longer have any direct relationship with their own customers. And we put up with this because it works. It's convenient, it's easy, you know, I like WhatsApp, it's good. Facebook is a nice way of keeping in touch with people. WordPress and Skype and Slack and PayPal, and they're all fantastic until one day something goes wrong, and they're not. October 2021, um, somebody at Meta, Facebook's parent company, was uh, supposed to be doing an inspection of all of the protocol definitions that connect all of Facebook's data center servers to the internet. And uh, for some complicated reason, instead of looking at them, it deleted them all. And the fail-safe that was supposed to stop you doing this didn't work. And Facebook went dark, completely vanished. Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, and Instagram, all hosted by Meta, just boom, disappeared. So what happened? First of all, there's a massive spike in DNS traffic from all of these browsers going, whoa, Facebook's not there. Maybe it moved. Hit the DNS root servers. Hey, what happened to Facebook.com? They're like, no, nope, hasn't moved, just not there. Then there was a massive spike on Twitter of people going, lol, Facebook <laughs> fell over. And then there was nothing for six and a half hours because Facebook couldn't get Facebook back up. Because uh, first of all, they figured there's a problem. All right, let's, let's remote in and fix it. Oh no, we can't get in. We can't remote into the data centers because all the routes are down. There's no connectivity. All right, let's drive down there. They get to the front door of the Facebook data center building. They can't get in the door because the keypads use the same authentication protocol as everything else. And they can't get on the network. The keypad can't get you in. Eventually, I don't know, somebody must have found a fire axe and smashed the door in, gone in, rebuilt the protocols and the routing tables, got the whole thing back up and running. And the beautiful irony about this is that the whole time it's going down, the people who work there, they can't use WhatsApp because it's down. They can't use their Facebook email because it's down. They can't use FB.com because it's down. They can't use Facebook Messenger because it's down. So Facebook had to coordinate its own resuscitation using open email, and phone calls and text messages, the very things that they are so hell-bent on destroying and trying to get everyone to use their platforms instead. Now, uh, I was thinking about this sort of general subject of email and uh, you know, accessibility and open platforms and stuff, and uh, <laughs> I discovered something cool. If you go back to this, uh, this map of the world, you see that we've color-coded the whole thing apart from one bit, the bit at the bottom, Antarctica, the white continent. Now, I didn't know that internet access in Antarctica was interesting, but it turns out internet access in Antarctica is seriously interesting. Antarctica, during the summer, there's about 5,000 people there. In the winter, it goes down to about 1,000. Now, uh, winter in Antarctica is dark for three months. There's not a hell of a lot to do. It'd be awesome to catch up on your Netflix, but you can't. There are no cables to Antarctica. Now, most places on Earth that don't have cable get their internet from a geostationary satellite network. Antarctica is so far south that the geostationary satellites are below the horizon. You can't see them. So internet access for those 5,000 people comes from... Uh, actually, there's, if anyone was watching this show, For All Mankind, um, and you see this, like the, the Apple TV alternate history of the space race, and there's a couple of scenes in that where uh, they're video conferencing with someone in Antarctica, and I'm like, no, no, rewind. I want to see the bit where you made video conferencing work to Antarctica. I know you've got Russians and water on the moon and everything, but I want to see how they did this bit. But yeah, McMurdo Station, 5,000 people sharing 25 megabits of satellite bandwidth for the 12 hours a day that they can see the Deep Space Relay Network, which is the satellites that NASA maintains to talk to the International Space Station and like the Cassini probes and all this kind of thing. The rest of the time, you have to use the Iridium satellite network. Now, Iridium has 66 satellites in a low Earth orbit, they're about 800 kilometers up, that will give you satellite voice data anywhere on the planet for a fee. To send an email over Iridium costs $3. One email, three bucks, without attachments, 
And uh, I discovered this fact the same day that I found out that Gmail was sending all my stuff to junk. And I thought if I had paid $3 to send someone an email from Antarctica and Gmail decided it was trash, I'd be unhappy. And then I thought, well, hang on. What if we could flip this around? What if we could have a model where instead of your email going to junk and costing $3, what if you could pay money to guarantee the email was going to be delivered? Now, we're going to jump in our DeLorean here go back in time, because I don't think we can fix this now. But let's play what if. Let's go back to uh, the day when, when you got a mobile phone plan, it was understood that you had to pay for every text messages, and you got a certain number. Because this is the same period of history, the mid-90s. The web was invented. People were getting online for the first time. What if we did a deal where when you got your internet connection, you had to pay a little bit of money to get email? You got 50 free emails a month. Now, uh, let me just see how we're how we doing for time here. Yeah, we, we'll be all right. Um, so let's imagine that we had a, uh, I want to send an email. Now, the way that uh, email works is the sender says, hey, who handles email for DylanBT.net? DNS says, hey, it's this server. You go, hey, I got an email here from Slash at Guns N' Roses. And says, OK, yeah, go, fine. I don't know if it's really Slash. No idea. Email doesn't support that. So what if we'd done this? What if the sender said, hey, who handles email for this? DNS said it's this one. Mail.dylanbt.net says, hey, I got an email from Guns N' Roses. And says to DNS, well, hang on. Who sends email for Guns N' Roses? And DNS says, it's Beatrice. For some reason, that's what Guns N' Roses email server would be called in this universe. And I ping them, and I say, hey, I got this unique message ID. Is this really from you? And it can reply, yes, go ahead. Or it can more likely say, no, I have no idea what that is. That is not really slash from Guns N' Roses. Now, email was designed in days when we didn't have always on connections. You know, SMTP could take up to seven days before it would finally give up. But that's not true anymore. We could do this kind of signed transactional email of validating individual messages. Now, we could build this. We have SSL. To most people, we just use SSL to guarantee security because we gave up on using SSL to guarantee identity. But technically, there's no reason we couldn't do that. And then we have, we have a secure cryptographic handshake between the email sender and the email receiver. And so why couldn't we use that to transfer funds? Why couldn't we have a thing where you deposit money with your internet provider, you're sending important papers to your lawyer, and you want to do the equivalent of priority paid mail, but on email, so you're like, hey, give this 50 cents. You pay two cents to your ISP for sending it, and the recipient, Imagine getting money to read junk mail. Imagine being able to email someone. Imagine being able to email, email someone 50 cents to play Wordle. And then play at Wordle.com goes, wow, we have $187,000 in our dashboard. And, you know, maybe they want to cash out. Or maybe you use this, you send an email to Amazon to pay for goods. You send an email to Netflix to pay for movies. You want to buy a new Steam game? You can pay by email. Email becomes a de facto form of currency. Now, I'm sure you've all seen this screen. This is, uh, you want to sign into Slack, and instead of remembering a password, it's like, well, we're going to send you an email and click the link that's going to get you in. It's using this two, uh, two sort of factor, two, two pronged authentication system. What if we could do more with that? Now, websites love tracking us, they love storing all kinds of email about us, but uh, there are certain things like your exact location. Most websites are like, I don't want to know every time you move. Like, when I want that information, I am going to say, hey, use my current location and my browser manages that, and it shares it as and when necessary with my consent. I say, yes, I allow you to have permission. We could push this model further. You know, what if you went to the point where the browser knew more stuff? The browser was like, uh, Amazon.com wants to sign in and wants to know where you live, just for this one delivery. What if Amazon wanted to pay a dollar to access my browser history? One dollar, two dollars, five dollars. This is our information. We have the technology to be able to store it and manage access to it ourselves, but instead companies out there are managing it on our behalf, and we have to ask lawyers to put in access information requests if we want to know what they're holding about us. Now, this is normally the point where some people in the audience start going, yeah, and we can do it all with blockchain. This, friends, is the only blockchain that you will ever find me using in a production environment. This is my blockchain uh, security key management system. Now, a little while ago, NFTs, like this one here, suddenly got a, a lot of attention. Now, uh, I, I, I right-click downloaded this picture. I didn't pay for it, but I did that when I was in London, and now I'm in Sweden. So I'm an international art thief, which is kind of cool. Um, NFTs, cryptocurrency, Web3, Ethereum, Bitcoin, all of it. Uh, <laughs> it's not going very well, really, is it? Um, <clears throat> somebody minted an NFT of Jack Dorsey's first tweet that they uh, bought for, they bought it for three million, then they tried to sell it for 50 million, and the top bid was $280. Do 
Molly White has this fantastic website. Web3 is going great, and it has a thing in the bottom corner here called the Griftometer, which as you scroll down the page, it keeps going up and up and up and showing you how much money people have lost through Web3, NFT, Ethereum, Bitcoin, crypto scams. Now, I think the biggest kind of, if you want a single red flag that Web3 is never ever gonna be everything that its evangelists think it's possibly gonna be, it's things like this. This is one of the core developers of Bitcoin who got robbed. Somebody, this person probably understands this protocol better than anyone on the planet, and someone broke into his wallet and stole all of his money, and his first response to being you know, a figurehead for the decentralized, we don't need big government, we don't need banks, we don't need this, someone took my money, hey, FBI, help. Yeah, if you're gonna call the FBI because someone stole your Bitcoin, you really do not believe in a decentralized finance system, and you don't think crypto is gonna have your back when it all goes wrong. As uh, Odin put it at NDC last year, Web3 is a pyramid of dumpster fires. But we don't actually know what Web3 is yet. I was there when we invented Web2. And in the year before we invented Web2, there were people saying Web2 is microformats. That's what it is. It's little embedded snippets. And someone else going, no, Web2 is the semantic web. It's where we have smart information that search engines use. Someone else is going, no, Web2 is Ajax. Web2 is a synchronous JavaScript. And someone else is going, Web2 is RSS feeds. Web2 is XML. Web2 is a SOAP access. It's REST APIs. No, it's blogs. No, it's reviews. And all of these things came from people going, the web could be better. The web, the, the read-only web 1.0 where companies put pages up and we read them, we wanted to do better. We wanted to get more involved with it. Some of these technologies have become ubiquitous. Ajax is just part of the web now. You know, some of them, the semantic web, well, those folks are still going, yes, the future of the web is semantic. I'm sure on some level it is. Microformats kind of came and went, didn't really catch on. And in hindsight, we seem to have sort of concluded that web 2.0 was user-generated content. And it's social media. It's you've been able to post your own stuff without having to set up your own website in order to do it. So, you know, maybe Web3 is about decentralization, but it's not Ethereum blockchains and non-fungible tokens. Now, when Elon Musk bought Twitter in November, a lot of folks I know jumped ship, and they jumped to Mastodon. And uh, I'm on there now, if anyone wants to come and, and follow me on Mastodon. Uh, Chris Nova has a server, Hackiderm, which is full of nerds and hackers and is a really kind of cool little place there. Um, it takes a little while to get used to, because it's not like Twitter. It's not the entire planet using the same website at the same time. It's connected communities. And information flows between those communities based on the preferences and the policies of the people who run them. And some people find this off-putting. But the point about it is that a billionaire cannot come along and buy Mastodon and ruin it. Impossible. It's not for sale. It can't be for sale. It'd be like trying to buy the web or trying to buy email. You could go to efforts to try and take control of it incrementally, but someone coming in like Musk did with Twitter and going, here's a big fat sack of money. I own it now. I'm going to fire all the people and wreck all the policies and sell blue ticks for eight bucks. It's just not going to happen. So maybe we're going to look back 10 years from now and be like, well, actually, Web3 was when everyone went, you know what? Nah, I'm bored of it. I do not accept the terms and conditions anymore. I reject the terms and conditions. What I want, you hear that? Oh, beautiful. Ooh. <laughs> what I want, other than a laptop that works properly, I want an IP address. I want to pay money for things that work, and then you give me a product and go away. Don't upsell me, don't subscribe me. I will buy tools, I will buy experiences, I will pay for media, I will pay for it with money, not with attention, not with kind of mediated things. I just want to pay for it. But other than that, give me my IP address, you have your IP address, and the trillion dollar corporations just get out of the way and let us have our fun. Thank you. <laughs>